curtain draws back as the cinema lights dim and the music gets louder. With a wiggle, you press your back into the seat as you ready yourself for the story to unfold. It's familiar with the rise of evil and the need for a hero. It comes in all sorts of forms, from corruption in politics or a despot ruler, gangs and apocalyptic clashes, to the arrival of intergalactic forces. People are in trouble and they cry for saving. And while the spirit realm makes a great spin for Hollywood, that's the stuff of make-believe. Or is it? Let me pray. Jesus, as we take some time to delve into your word, as we potentially even delve into some areas that might be a little bit uncomfortable, would you help us to understand what it is that you want to say to us today? Would we have ears that are open to hear, eyes that will see you at work, and that we would be able to respond to you this day? In Jesus' name, amen. The sound of the gravel shore rubbed onto the underbelly of the boat as it came to an abrupt stop. The head count, 11, 12, 13, confirmed that they'd all made it through the storm that would go down in history as one of those that seasoned fishermen would never forget. Now the disciples and Jesus found themselves on the eastern shore of the Sea of Galilee in Gentile territory. The region of Gerasenes, or Gergesa, and it's later been known to come to be known as Kersey, was a region known for its pig farming. Just to the south was Umquis, where pigs held dominance over all other farm animals. Where farm animals like sheep and goats and cattle had others' uses, pigs were good for only one thing. These unclean animals for the Jews were butchered by Gentiles for food and in pagan sacrifice. Pigs would not die of old age. The disciples now resting on the shoreline. The joy of terra firma under their feet is soon replaced by terrified. A man possessed by an evil spirit came out from the tombs to meet Jesus. This man lived in the burial caves and could no longer be restrained even with chains. Whenever he was put into chains and shackles as he often was, he snapped the chains from his wrists and smashed the shackles. No one was strong enough to subdue, to tame, to domesticate him. Day and night he wandered among the burial caves in the hills, howling and cutting himself with sharp stones. The man knows that within the group coming ashore is no ordinary person. The spirits recognise the presence of divinity. They know Jesus, whether in a moment of senility or compelled by the evil within. Regardless, the man runs to meet Jesus and bows before his polar opposite. Jesus speaks with clarity and authority. Come out of the man, you evil spirit. With a shriek, all that is evil screams in response to that which is all that is good. A scream that sends chills through the disciples right to their very core. We have nothing in common. Why are you interfering with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? In the name of God, I beg you, don't torture me. The exchange of names is not some pleasantry, nor is it necessary for Jesus to overpower evil. But to reveal the severity, Jesus demands, what is your name? The evil within cries out, my name is Legion, 
because there are many of us inside the man. The evil spirit begs Jesus again and again not to send them to a distant place. To wander aimlessly would be torture. But to inhabit something, anything, would be a concession that they cried out for. There happened to be a large herd of pigs feeding on the hillside nearby. Send us into those pigs, the spirits begged. Let us enter them. So Jesus gave them permission. The evil spirits came out of the man and entered the pigs and the entire herd of about 2,000 pigs plunged down the steep hillside into the lake and drowned in the water. For the Jewish audience, this was a win, win, win. Finally, the man is cleansed. The evil spirits are with the pigs and the land is cleansed of the pigs. For the Gentile pig herders, it was anything but a win. Fleeing to the nearby towns and the surrounding countryside, they they spread the news as they ran. People rushed out to see what happened. A crowd soon gathers around Jesus and they saw the man who had been possessed by a legion of demons. He was sitting there, fully clothed and perfectly sane, and they were all afraid. Then those who had seen what happened told the others about the uh, demon-possessed man and the pigs. On another occasion, in another place, a woman at a well rushes to a Samaritan village to tell people about Jesus. When they come out to see him, they begged him to stay, to stay in their village. So Jesus stayed there for two days, long enough for many more to hear his message and believe. But not this time. Not in this land. Rather than begging Jesus to stay, the crowd began pleading with Jesus to go away and to leave them alone. It's a sad irony, isn't it? That demons plead with Jesus to leave them alone so that they can stay. And the townspeople plead with Jesus to leave to to leave them alone, to go away. But for now, Jesus' work here is done. As he's getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with Jesus. But Jesus said, no, go home. Go home to your family and tell them everything that the Lord has done for you and how merciful he has been. Perhaps... Perhaps he wanted to become a disciple, and perhaps he did. After all, doesn't a disciple of Jesus tell the good news of who Jesus is to others and all that he has done? The man meets Jesus' powerful mercy and is restored to wholeness. His encounter with Jesus makes him fully human again fully human and now with a family again, a home and a mission in life. He is no longer a beast with whom people needed to try and tame, to subdue, to domesticate, but a human being called to proclaim the explosion of God's mercy in his life. So the man started off to visit the ten towns of that region, the Decapolis, and began proclaiming the great things that Jesus had done for him. And everyone was amazed at what he told them. If you have your Bibles with you, I invite you to turn to that story in Mark chapter 5, where you can read for yourself this account of Jesus engaging in spiritual warfare. Perhaps this story raises questions for you and you wonder about the spiritual realm and what it means for us today and our understanding of good and evil, God and Satan, angels and demons, spiritual possession, oppression and influence. I'll invite Mary to join me up here in a moment 
and we'll do our best to respond to any questions that you might have. And I'll have a roving mic, and I'm wondering whether, Chris, can I invite you to wander around with the roving mic, if that's okay? Um, and if you have any questions that you prefer not to read out but would like to give to Chris, and then she can, um, at an opportune time, bring a couple of those up as well, and we can read those out and hopefully respond to those. But as I reflect on this passage, and passages such as this, and in the world in which we live, I see various responses. Some deny the existence of anything supernatural at all and treat it all as nonsense. In others, there is an acceptance of the physical manifestations of good and evil, but a rejection of the spiritual equivalents. Others see evil spirits in photocopiers that jam and every sickness that someone has is Satan at work and needs to be cast out. Some treat the spiritual with contempt and a joke and Hollywood doesn't care as long as it can make money out of it. But what should we make of this? Reading the Gospels and the Bible as a whole, how should we respond? For me, there's a couple of things of note here. The Gospels treat evil, including evil spirits, and their ability to possess people as a matter of fact. This was not something that was debated, if it could happen, but it was recognised that it did, not because they were uneducated or misguided. Jesus himself is not uneducated or misguided. Jesus acknowledges the existence of evil and evil spirits. Not only does he confront and cast out evil spirits, but in the verses that Leah read out to us earlier from Luke 11, Jesus says to the Pharisees that the Jewish religious establishment has exorcists. And what about your exorcists? They cast out demons too. Rather than treating it as a joke and some Hollywood entertainment, the Bible takes evil and evil spirits seriously. The aim of evil and evil spirits are the same. To undermine what God is trying to do and has been doing. To tear down, to take away from God wherever it can. The Satan is the adversary, the enemy of God and all that is good. That can happen in confronting ways like possessing a person where evil takes hold of a person's life. Or it can be more subtle. And evil is just as happy when we think that we have no need of God at all. But to believe that God exists is not that special if it does not transform the way that you live. After all, James says in James chapter 2, verse 19, you say you have faith, you believe that there is one God. Good for you. Even the demons believe this. And they tremble in terror. The impact of sin and evil is also all around us. Paul writes about how creation groans, waiting for its day of redemption. We see the groaning and the brokenness of creation in places like Turkey, in Syria, in Russia, in Ukraine. The world is broken and is in need of saving. And that is why Jesus came. The heart of the good news is that Jesus came so that we could live life well through a restored relationship with Creator God. We are not to fear evil and the demonic, but nor should we treat it with contempt. Satan wants to at least inoculate people against God. Or even better, to have them work towards opposing the kingdom of God. I'm going to bring a couple of stools across and invite Mary up for a bit of Q&A. And I'll invite Chris if she could come up and grab the microphone. And maybe for you, as we've raised some of this stuff... It raises some questions for you. And just check to make sure that microphone's on, Chris. Um, There we go. Yep. Excellent.
next slide. So feel free to grab a seat. Um, so maybe this raises some, yep. You're right, Taya, hold that. Um, maybe this raises some questions for you, some stuff that you think, well, what about this? How does this work? I'm not sure. Um, what does the Bible say about this area of life? There could be a variety of questions that you might have. But if you at home um, have a question, we'll do our best to also unmute you. Uh, but for those in the auditorium, if you have some questions about anything that has been raised already, um, happy to try and respond to some of those. And then after a few minutes, um, after we've had a bit of Q&A, uh, then I'm happy to wrap up with a couple more thoughts before we finish this time. So um, anything that comes up for you as we've been talking about uh, some of this stuff? Yeah, go for it. We'll just have a microphone come up to you so that everyone can hear your question. So how do you interpret, like, the evil spirit's effect on our life then? Because you talked about different interpretations. Like, do you see it just as something affecting literally our spirits? Or because um, you said that, you know, possession, you believe possession is real. Like, what's your interpretation? Yeah, great question. Um, probably I'll answer that in two ways. One, I think there's three frameworks where evil and sin impacts the world. Um, there's the impact of the brokenness of worlds, so earthquakes and those sorts of things. So there's that impact of living in a broken and a fallen world. So there's the world, there's the flesh, our own sinful behaviour, because we want to have our own way and do our own thing. So there's the world, the flesh, and then there's the devil that tries to, uh, or Satan, or evil spirits, evil forces, that try to affect and have an impact on our lives. Uh, for the way it can impact people, yes, just as the Holy Spirit um, abides within us as followers of Jesus, there is the ability for spirits to abide in people, to um, reside within people, and to affect their behaviour, and even uh, influence the, what they say and uh, that sort of thing. So there's, that would be classes like possession. Um, there is also what we would sometimes class as oppression. So there's almost like a, a desire to influence um, people as well. So it might not be an internal force, but it might be an external push in a particular direction. And so one of the ways that we see evidence of that is in a follower of Jesus called Peter. So when Peter is wanting to stop um, the plan of God to be um, affected by Jesus going to the cross and saying, no, 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 Jesus, not going to let that happen, um, that's Satan trying to um, oppress or trying to influence the outcome and what we see Jesus respond to in that situation is he says, not to Peter, but to that influence, um, get behind me, Satan. You're a trap, you're a snare, you're, you're, you're trying to tempt me again, just as Satan tried to tempt Jesus at the start of his ministry. He continued to try and tempt Jesus throughout his ministry, and that's another occasion where we see that influence taking place. So there can be an inward um, residing of evil spirits, and we see that in this account today. But there can also be an outward um, manipulation or um, pressing or trying to, to nudge people to do certain things as well. So I, I see those as, as a couple of examples of that. I'm not sure if you wanted to add anything else to that, Mary? Um, it was a very good question, David. And yes, this David and I have both seen influences of Satan personally. Um, we lived in a very small town in Queensland and there was a man in the town called Graham and Graham owned a coffee shop and David and Graham struck up a bit of a relationship over coffee because they both really liked 
coffee. And Graham came one night for dinner at our place and David had a sore shoulder. And Graham said to David, I'm just going to put my hand on your shoulder and it will be much better than it was before. And I said to Graham, are you planning on doing a Reiki healing? And he said, yes, I am. And I said to him, well, it won't work because your spirit guide is outside. He's not permitted inside our place. I've prayed over it. And he said to me, he, Graham, said to me, how do you know the spirit guide is outside? And I said, because he's hovering outside our dining room door and the, bil- the part of the building was three steps up and he was not at ground level. He was at the same height as our dining room. And Graham said, I don't believe you, describe him. So I did. And Graham said to me, that is my spirit guide. I have never seen him. In fact, you are the scariest Christian I've ever met. I said to him, that's probably the best compliment I've ever had, to be quite honest. But the fact is that it was very real and Graham, who was not a Christian, was very, very well aware of who I was talking about. Um, So we've had some experiences that are very real in in the real world and you, I, I guess unless you are prepared... You don't expect to see those things or hear those things at all. Thanks. Uh, Other questions that people might have? Um, This isn't designed to try and freak people out or anything like that, but just to hopefully give a a bit of an understanding and if you have questions, now's a great time to to ask those. Um, Sam might have some experience as well. I don't want to rule her out um, in that space and... Uh, if she wants to add to that, that's fine as well. Amy. This could be a very simplistic question and, and um, I'm quite curious about all the stories because um, my, my, my father, um, my dad, has had some experiences like that when there were missionaries in Mexico. Yep. I guess my question would be moving forward if we were uh, exposed to somebody like that, as Christians, how would we respond or protect ourselves? I know that when we were younger, um, from the stories that dad had told us, you know, he said that in the Bible it states that if you're confronted with with a man possessed, that you'd say something um, like, you know, the Lamb of God, and you mean it. Um, And I know it's quite simple, but Mm. I, I, I suppose my question is, what would we do if we were exposed to somebody like that and how would we kind of protect ourselves? Yeah, yeah. Uh, for me, there's probably a couple of things. One, um, who do you associate with? So if you are associating with Jesus, if you're sticking close to Jesus, then there is um, protection that you experience from your relationship with Jesus. If you disassociate yourself, if you keep yourself away from Jesus, then it increases the impact or the risks associated with that stuff. Um, so one, the most important thing is, um, Peter talks about it, that the, the, the enemy Satan um, uh, prowls around like a roaring lion. Resist him, he will flee from you, and stick, basically it says to go on to, and to stick close to God, to abide with God. Um, and by doing um, the, or having a commitment to stay close to Jesus, spend time in his word, to pray, to get to know Jesus well, um, does provide a, a significant um, level of protection um, for you. As far as what to do with the other person, it depends on what's going on for them. They can just be going about their own business and they don't really care and don't want to engage with who you are and who you represent. There are other times where there, there might be that confrontation and it's working out, okay, um, are you physically safe? And if not, then move to a position where you can be physically safe um, is also something that is important. Um, but absolutely, you can pray. You can pray out loud. Um, You can say, Jesus, I I want to claim your promises that you will never leave me, you will never forsake me and that I ask for your protection right now 
and for whatever evil or whatever ill will um, is wanting to be um, about in this space, I want to reject that and I want to stand against it. Um, and so there's the, the, I guess some people would say, the claiming of the promises of Jesus and also the rejection of the attack of Satan in that space. Um, there are more things as far as um, engaging. Um, if some people have a gift in that space, and if so, that's great. For those that don't, then I would say always tread carefully um, about engaging um, with evil spirits or people that are, are demon-possessed um, because um, there are accounts, the seven sons of Sceva, um, he was a priest, and the seven sons thought they'd claim the name of Jesus and claim the name of Paul and cast out this demon, and the man jumped up and beat the stuffing out of him, uh, all seven of them, and that's in, in an account in Acts. Um, and so you don't want to go into it foolhardy and arrogant or cocky or anything like that. You want to have a, an appreciation for what, what is going on. So I'm not sure if Mary wants to add anything to that. It certainly says in the Bible about um, casting out of demons, but it also says um, about prayer in relation to casting out demons, to be protected from the demonic, etc. And so I would say to you, if you're confronted by someone who is obviously um, agitated and I mean, we've even had people in the church who've come here agitated, swearing whenever the communion's on there. Someone it ramps it up for them. Absolutely. And so there is nothing wrong with talking to someone else that you know prays and someone who will help you deal with your feelings about that, whether it be fear or concern or what, whatever it is um, that you might feel about it. But it does say in the Bible that there are demons that will not leave us alone unless there is prayer and fasting. And so it's very important that if you know someone is coming here regularly who has a, an issue that needs prayer, that you bring it to the attention of those who do pray because God will often reveal things to us about people not to judge them, but to help them. And it's really important that as a congregation that we are fully focused on being obedient to God and to praying. We need not be scared. You're right. We are washed in the blood of the Lamb. He can do nothing to us. He, Satan, can do nothing to us personally. But it doesn't mean that he does not impact us, our congregation or others by the behaviour of other people who are being oppressed or uh, indeed possessed by evil spirits. We've had them here. Some of you may know that, some of you may not. But we have had people come through here, because, particularly because of care works. We've had a number of people come along who have had um, impact, been impacted by Satan. Other questions or... Yep, Colleen. Thanks, Chris. Give you some exercise this morning. She probably doesn't need any more. Yes, <laughs> I just wanted to um, comment on what's just been said <clears throat> because I've had a bit of experience in it too. Um, not to my credit part of it, but still... Uh, I had, and first of all, I don't believe that all people who have mental illness are demon possessed. Absolutely, yep. and I would agree wholeheartedly with that. Not. However, I had a, a schizophrenic man who um, I knew quite well, and was giving him medication. And he, while he was on his medication, he was very good, but it had opened him because. But his family called me one day and um, said he's standing naked in the front room and swearing his heart out. And so, uh, come and do something about it. You know? So I dropped everything and went. And um, oh, he, he was the face of evil. He was just transformed. It was just awful. 
Uh, and I just prayed like mad. Um, and, uh, but I was quite at peace about it. And uh, he said to me as he crouched in the corner, he got into the corner of the room and crouched, and he said, I'm going to kill you. And I just said to him, well, I'm sorry about that, but you can't because I belong to the Lord Jesus. And he, he, he really went berserk at that point. Now, looking back, I know that if, if I had said, leave him, it would have gone. But I couldn't think where to send it. And, and I hadn't prepared myself. I know now that I could have sent him to where the demons go, to the, that pit. But there weren't any pigs around. I did think of pigs. <laughs> um, but anyhow, I, I just told him to calm down and that he wasn't going to hurt not me or anyone else in the room because his parents were scared stiff. And uh, we called an ambulance. They said no, the police were the people and the police came and took him away. So I found that was a failure on my part. I wasn't prepared. Um, after that, when I've had people that I felt were demon-possessed, which like a lady who kept on going like this, and she said, I asked her why was she covering her eyes like this, and she said, oh, it's to get those people out of my eyes. They're in my head. And um, I found out that she was a Catholic, and I took her to a charismatic Catholic priest and, and left him with her in his hands. Yep. But uh, they're real. Mm. They're real. Yep. But we are protected. Yep. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Colleen. I would quickly just like to say something about that as well. As I said to Amy, it's very important that we are people who pray and that if someone is ever in a situation like Colleen, confronted by someone who's got a demonic sort of problem, we need to be people who are available to pray for that person while they're confronting that situation. I think we need to remember that we are not people who live in isolation. We are a church family and it says in the Bible about being the body of Christ and we need every part, not just one part, not just the mouth, but the people who pray as well. They take part in being the heart of God in that situation. And it's very, very important. I cannot stress it enough. Going forward, if we make decisions about changing the community in some way, uh, we need to be people who have prayer at the forefront of everything we say and everything we do all of the time. And it doesn't matter how young you are or how old you are, everybody can pray. So we need to all be doing it. Got time for one more question, whether it be someone at home or someone else in the auditorium uh, before I wrap up. Yep, Victor. Thank you, Pastor David. In church, <clears throat> uh, I have experience of um, seeing someone you know, take control by the devil. <clears throat> That's the only once in my life. <clears throat> we went for a mission trip with a team. And one of our we, we have activities the whole day. In the night, we have a meeting to talk about what we have done today. After our meeting finished, everyone ready to get to bed. But one of, one of the young men next to me, he's, he's the most closest to me. <laughs> he, he lie down and his body getting straight, getting hard. Like a, I thought the first mind, I thought he, he got heart attack. <clears throat> I prayed to God, I said, no, Lord, we don't want this. Because we are very, very, very on the mountain, we cross many mountains, we, we have to go to the hospital. <clears throat> and he's, he, he 
<coughs> like that, you know, it's really strange. And when we start to pray, I start to pray for him. He look at me, you know, like a <laughs> movie that you watch. You know, he look at me with strange eyes and scary. <coughs> and all the, and we, we, I realize this is not heart attack. Actually, the devil. <coughs> and it uh, surprised me because in, in the short that moment, he's a Christian, a young boy, you know. <coughs> but uh, this is really quick, quick happening. And then we, we, all of us said, we, we, let's pray for him, you know. And uh, one of my friends says, don't entertain. The, the devil tried to take control of him, and he really couldn't have a word out from his mouth. And uh, we started to pray for him. We said, call the name of Jesus. He's really struggling to, to say a word. His voice is like a, like this. But uh, we, we said, don't give up, don't entertain. You know, we keep praying for him. Around, <laughs> around 20 minutes, and then uh, he started to release the word. Really, really uh, getting, getting up, you know. This yeah. is <laughs> just something that we said, keep, keep calling Jesus' name. <laughs> no, his eyes is going around and until he released the word Jesus only one time and totally sleep he's quiet and calm you know, and maybe three minutes he wake up he said what happened <laughs> we explain things to him you know. and it's my experience that um, it might get you some picture of uh the, the devil is around us, you know, can access someone weak, someone have a, a mind or according to flesh and anything to us. So that, that is some idea, the, the picture that can yep. help you. All right. Thank you so much. All right. Thanks, Mary. Appreciate that. There might be other questions that you have in this regard and more than happy to chat to you about it um, later as well or you can uh, put some of those on a response card as well. But So how do we respond to, to evil, the supernatural, spiritual warfare, those sorts of things? There's danger in trying to be formulaic or prescriptive. We don't see evidence of that in the Bible but there are a few principles that stand out in Mark chapter 5. First of all, evil is real. And Satan, the adversary, and demons, unclean spirits, are also very real. Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and evil spirits in the heavenly places. Just as in Mark 5, uh, there will be times that uh, to set people free from evil, we need to go where they are. But just because we do does not mean that we're going to automatically be welcome. We also see, see some merit in this passage about territorial spirits as well, that they work in a particular area or a location or a region, and Mary and I have experienced that as well. On the face of it, sometimes mental health issues and the effects of evil spirits can look very similar, but they need to be responded to differently. Otherwise, you can cause untold harm by treating someone that has a mental health issue as if they're demon-possessed, and that is not okay. The damage that you can do to someone and the long-term effects that that can have when there can be some simple uh, long-term but medical intervention is need, needs to be the focus in that circumstance. But absolutely pray. Pray for them. Pray with them. Pray through that situation as well. Rather than living in fear, as we discussed earlier, stick close to Jesus. Invest in your relationship with Jesus and know the security of having a deep, rich relationship with Jesus and strive to live it out, faith in words and love and deeds. We see this in the man's approach to trying to deal with the effects of evil is to try and put chains on man. 
but we see in Jesus that God wants to set the heart of the person, the life of the person free. He confronts evil, but he has compassion on the person. But people, once again, in this story we see, but people can choose. They can either move towards freedom that is offered by Jesus or they can reject it. But when it comes to a personal relationship with Jesus, what will you choose? How will you choose to respond to this Jesus that has victory over evil and is able to bring transformative life to us? Let me pray. Jesus, we hear an account that can make us feel uncomfortable, that we can want to relegate to superstition or a bygone era. Lord, we recognise that even today there are principalities and powers at work, forces that we do not see but we see the effects of, in governments that want to manipulate and use um, power to their own advantage, in the way that people can try and hurt and harm and manifest evil in all sorts of forms. But we thank you that through your death and through your resurrection that you have overcome evil, sin and the grave. And we thank you that there is victory and there is the ability to have a restored relationship with Creator God through you. And we are grateful for that. Lord, help us to live um, in the light of your love in every aspect of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.